I am Andrus Kulikowskis. This is Math for Wisdom, a meeting of our physics study group led by John Harland. And today I will interview John about his research program, uh, the story of his life as a investigator with a passion for physics, a PhD in functional analysis, uh, mathematics uh, from the University of California, San Diego. John teaches at um, Palomar College. Uh, we're old friends from graduate school. Uh, we've been studying for the last three years uh, together, um, starting with uh, Griffiths. We both have uh, bachelor's degrees in, in physics, uh, so we went back to that. But uh, John will tell me about his um, uh, research into the foundations of uh, physics, how to place them on a more satisfactory uh, setting. Um, which will be based, of course, on his personal aesthetics, his sense of truth as a difficult path. Hello, John. Hello. Thanks for that intro. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I mean, physics um, is, I think, well, I mean, the closest analogy I have to where physics is, is perhaps analogous to where math was maybe maybe 200 years ago uh, or or up to maybe 150 years ago um no I, I would say no I think 200 years ago probably more than more like 250 years ago because I think things started to um, in mathematics get uh, put on a more solid footing, um, with the work of the analysts in the early 1800s. And I think by the 1850s, I'm not an expert on the history of math, but by the 1850s, the theory of limits, I think, was uh, pretty much worked out and, and, and accepted by mathematicians and was starting to, um, well, it was, I think, the foundational the logical foundational footing of calculus had been established by that time. Whereas I think 250 years ago, not so much. So it's a, it's remarkable that there were people like Euler and Gauss, uh, you know, amazing, you know, Laplace, ama amazing contributors to math and physics um, that were working on kind of a shaky foundation of mathematics, in particular analysis, you know, the kind of math that comes from calculus, uh, the kind of math that comes from the real numbers. Uh, they were able to make progress, and yet mathematics was not on the same foundation as, say, Euclidean geometry back then. Euclidean geometry, you had axioms. You could prove it's, it seemed everything of, of, of value from those axioms using the rules of logic, and calculus was not the same. Calculus was had mysteries in it. It had... Uh, it was certainly useful um, for describing things like physics. It was extremely, you uh, uh, you know, uh, well utilized. Yet, I think probably a lot of mathematicians did not view it as mathematics per se. It was it was not on the same foundation. It was not on the same uh, solid foundation as other areas of math like algebra and and geometry. That's my take. So there was a transition that happened uh, mainly in the 1800s. And certainly by the end of the 1800s, you have Cantor set theory. You have much more elaborate ways of, of talking about limits. Um, and that led to the explosion in modern, modern analysis. Um, you know, all that kind of had to be shored up before you could, I think, reach the, the current era, era in mathematics. And why do I think physics is like that? Because physics, we use uh, mathematical ideas that are not on a solid footing. We There's areas of physics that contradict one another. Um, there's apparent paradoxes that we don't know how to resolve. Um, yet we make progress. But those of us who are concerned about the foundations of physics feel very uh, some kind of trepidation about 
the state of the matter. And in particular, for me, physics is hard to learn. Um, I think physics is harder to learn than mathematics for me. Um, precisely because there's so many questions, you know, that come up as you're learning it that have only obscure answers. In other words, it's sort of like, we're not going to, we don't really know why this works. We're doing it. <laughs> and uh, you have to accept, you know, that this process will lead toward uh, theoretical predictions of, of, of the outcomes of experiments that can then be verified in 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 careful uh, laboratory settings. But it doesn't really give you the satisfying uh, mental framework and mental mental images of why things are working out. You know, why is the universe constructed this way? Um, and I think that maybe mathematicians 200 or 250 years ago felt the same way about calculus. Like, why is it okay to make sense of zero over zero? What, it, you know, what on earth does that mean? It, it makes sense in certain cases and it doesn't make sense in other cases. You know? I think of the rules of the game, you know, that if the rules are clear, then it's possible to invest yourself in the game and feel comfortable uh, playing it. Right. But whether it was, you know, the early days of calculus or um, the physics we were taught, uh, you are told, uh, look here, but don't look there, you know, <laughs> and don't think about this. Like, yeah. think about this, think about what you. So the, the question is like, well, how do I, how can I invest myself in rules that just seem so very select? It's you just know. kind of. Well, you know, I think. For me, it's a bit more subtle than that. I kind of subscribe to, you know, a famous quote about it's attributed to von Neumann. It might, it might have gone, he might, he might have just been retweeting someone else. Uh, but you know, in math, you don't really understand things; you just get used to them. And uh, um, I think that's largely true from my from my experience. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, why am I? comfortable with measure theory or you know operator theory or whatever is because I've worked with it enough to get used to it but I still think that there's a difference between getting used to things in physics and getting used to things in mathematics in mathematics I always have the confidence that if I want to I could dig far enough down mm -hmm. that I could satisfy whatever approximate questions I have I could I can resolve things in a logical manner and, and in fact that's how I learned math I, I'm confused about something or I you know, I know it works out. I want to do it some other way. You know, I can I can go back to foundational uh, ideas, and and it might take me quite some time, but I can always rederive things in a different way. Um, there isn't like this arbitrary path that you have to follow. You can follow multiple paths. Uh, it's very broad the way you can approach problems in math, uh, because basically foundational issues, for the most part, uh, don't creep into that area of math that you're interested in now there are foundational issues in math for sure you know i mean like girdle's theorem introduces some mystery um you know the fact you know that at some point you know girdle's theorem and just the axiomatic system in general tells you you've got to accept things at some point you have to I mean, whether you accept them or not in your heart you have to sort of play by these rules you know the problem with physics is that those rules aren't entirely consistent. They're, 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 they're in contradiction with one another. And as I understand quantum field theory, and I'm not, you know, I know very little about it, but, um, you know, the, you know, a practitioner of quantum field theory has to make certain aesthetic or intuitive choices uh, that the mathematics is powerless to guide them through. And, then they have to make predictions from them and then they have to go to the laboratory and, and so in a sense it's a very frontier time for physics it's a very formative exciting time you know um as physicists physicists do things that they don't entirely understand they're working with the system that's bigger than they are they're trying to punch their way out of a paper bag and it's it's kind of neat to be in 
an era when things aren't fully formulated. I think it's, I think it's kind of, in a sense, it's a beautiful, um, uh, you know, kind of a example of human investigation through the ages where you don't know the full picture, but you're able to learn more and more by your proximate environment. Um, and I think that's the way physics is. And I, I, the reason why I object to it, because I find those found, I find, I don't object to it, but the reason why I think it's important to understand the foundations of physics is because, uh, first of all, it's something I'm very interested in. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I would like there to be a more solid picture. I would like physics to be more like mathematics. Um, it may never be, we don't know, you know, but I think it's a worthy, it's, it's a worthy uh, endeavor. And to me, it, it was an intellectual affront learning physics, especially quantum mechanics, especially the way it was taught back in my day. I think there's much better sources now. I think like Griffith's book is a big advance on what mm -hmm. we used to learn from. Yeah, we've, we've enjoyed that. I'm just to encourage you to keep going uh, along this path uh, uh, to ask you to talk about uh, your um, maybe starting from your studies, uh, how you came to feel that those foundations are shaky and what in particular were the issues uh, that you feel uh, you'd like to be addressing? Well, I mean, as a, as a learner back in, back in the day when I first learned this stuff, it was just the, the rules of electromagnetism and the rules of uh, mechanics, Newtonian mechanics, were very carefully laid out, like axiomatically, right? And then you get to quantum mechanics. They introduce all this, all this stuff, you know, like operators, and, you know, like, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, some function theory, L two theory, and you know, all of a sudden you're working in this different realm, and you ask, well, why are we, why are we doing this? And and basically the the answer is. Well, matter is like a wave, and we have to create a wave theory for matter. And waves are functions, and um, and then you know what are observables? There are some sort of averages of those functions. Um, you know, it it gets it gets hazy just from the mathematical point of view. Now, I think there's much better ways of describing it now. You know, there's much, you know, like quantum. Uh, you know, quantum sample spaces and stuff. It it kind of lays it out a little bit more clearly, but actually von Neumann, I think if they just taught sort of the von Neumann point of view of what, you know, what the role of project, projections in experiment, experiments and so forth, I, I think would have clarified things. I think the teaching was, was problematic. And those ideas were already, you know, the idea of a quantum sample space and that kind of stuff was already out there. It just wasn't standard to teach it for undergraduates. Um, yeah, so because of probably maybe from the reason of mathematical sophistication. Is that right? Like might have been. And, and you know, the, the thing is, is Griffiths doesn't even address things on the level that I think should be addressed. You know, this is a pedagogical thing. You know, it's like a, I don't know. It, because I'm mathematical, I'm very mathematical, you know, and I have, you know, uh, you know, develop, you know, a certain competency in math. I like to, I like to see things at those foundational levels, and they weren't they weren't taught from that point of view. So I had to dig out, you know, from di different resources those levels, and you know, in a, in, a, in a sense, it's kind of fun. It's an investigation, but I think it would have it would have been good for my mind organizing it from the beginning. Uh, like that. So and so, what resources did you find helpful? I think you you read Feynman's lectures. Is that right? Well, like uh, Feynman was very useful. Um, von Neumann's book um, on the mathematical foundations of quantum theory, I think, is very very helpful. Um, there was a little book by Temple, um, a physicist from England or something, who kind of distilled Feynman's theory, especially the the role of projections in experimentation. Um, and you know why experiments go or you know in a certain epistemological epistemological way 
equivalent to projections in operator theory. Yeah. So that's that's kind of a an important piece. Um, and then just learning more mathematics, like I became a functional analyst, and that is the mm -hmm. that's the mathematics of basic quantum mechanics. Um, so you know all that stuff is now, you know, very familiar ground for me. Like I like thinking in terms of unitary dynamics as opposed to Lagrangian because that's kind of my wheelhouse. Mm -hmm. I think it's a more compact way of understanding things. Um, so in a sense, it was my own education led me bewildered, and I had to dig. But then, but then more than that, when you when you uh, look, stand back and look at quantum mechanics, there's a certain inherent obscurity. And the, and the obscurity comes from this. Quantum mechanics is a dynamical theory. The, the Schrodinger equation is a dynamical equation. It's, it's, a, it's a wave equation of sorts. It's a field, it's kind of a field equation, really. I don't know if you should call it a whale. It's like a quantum field in a certain sense. It's a like an, it's got a real and imaginary part, so it's got two components to the quantum field. Um, call it a pre-probability, call it the state of the system, call it the wave function, whatever you want to call it. They're, they all fall short of really maybe uh, describing what it really is. In fact, we kind of, even now we don't know what it is, you know, really. We don't know the optimal words for passing over this, this object that describes the state of the system or the free probability of an experiment, you know, or the wave function, you know, they're all, to me, they all kind of fall short because we don't really know what this thing is. Okay, so there's that, there's that obscurity. But then there's also, okay. I'm sorry, I, I should back up. I'm, I'm, I'm confuddling things. There's a dynamical model of how this thing, let's call it the wave function, changes over time call it the Schrodinger equation, the Dirac equation, whatever, you know, there, there's a well-defined trajectory of this vector, this function through function space, and it's given by that equation. That equation is equivalent to unitary dynamics, and we've talked about that through Stone's theorem, so it's a unitary dynamical thing where there's a smooth evolution, just like just like Newton's theory predicts a smooth evolution of points through space, ma masses through space, uh, collections of mass like planets through space, smooth evolution, and figure out what's going to go on at each future point in time from the current state of the system and the surrounding environment described by the, a potential. In other words, everything is known from the current state and 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 the environment. And that's true in Newton's law, it's true in quantum mechanics. And actually it was Feynman and I think Stephen Hawking, you know, reading them convinced me of that, that it really is just a dynamical theory. And Stephen Hawking was really kind of poignant when he said, it was really Newton who discovered this stuff. It wasn't Einstein, it wasn't Schrodinger, it was Newton who really got the ball rolling on dynamical theory. Which book of Hawking's is this? Uh, do you remember? A uh, brief history of time. Okay. So it's just a dynamical theory, you know? And so we all, that pedigree dates back to the mind of Isaac Newton. He started it. So all this stuff, Einstein's equations, Schrodinger's equations, they're all just a, they're, they're all just tweaks on, on that idea of dynamical theory. The problem is, that that's not the complete picture of quantum mechanics. There's a dynamical part and there's a measurement part. There's two parts of quantum mechanics. And again, I wish my undergraduate teachers would have explained this to me. And they probably did it, you know, for some reason it, it didn't reach me at the time. The dynamical theory only takes you so far. In Newton's theory, it gives you the exact outcomes of experiments up to experimental error in measurement, or error in the initial conditions, or error in the description of the environment. You know, but there are certain inherent errors that are reasonable, but up to those errors, you can describe things with precision. 
not so much not not the case with quantum mechanics you can only describe things with uh certain probabilities that that is the state of the function the pre-probability the wave function only describes the outcomes of experiments in a probabilistic or statistical sense so something else happens maybe nothing happens we don't know <laughs> but uh when we go to do an experiment and the wave function says you know the particle is going to be in this area of space but you know it could be to the left it could be the right of center it could be dead center only with certain probabilities that when you do this experiment again and again and again you're going to sweep out that probability distribution by doing empirical probabilities and it will agree with the theoretical probabilities given by the wave function and so this probabilistic interpretation believe it or not strangely enough did not come out of schrodinger's a pa paper it, you know it took it had to be processed through um born's um analysis to a year or two later come up with the probabilistic interpretation of the wave function so it, it's strange that heisenberg and schrodinger could think about quantum mechanics without making this connection to experiment like a, it's just mm. amazing like uh, just to me, fiddling with the equations and I mean, seeing me, what is needed to. to me, it's just it's just like the 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 power of mathematics together with intuition is just astounding that they could they could do that without really knowing what this what this object what these objects were telling them. You know, they found just the right mathematical model for predicting the energy spectrum within a within a fraction you know within a half a percent or something and um, and um, so yeah I, it, to me to me it's just it, it's it's remarkable so, so, that, that that time in that time in physics is quite remarkable to me like i think it's just such an interesting formative time where people were discovering things like they were astounding without mm -hmm. without a model so so what came out of this is that there's really two parts of quantum mechanics a dynamical part and a measurement part and so uh, then there were different schools of thought about it. There were people who believed that, like von Neumann, that there is no way to complete quantum mechanics, that there's no missing part, you know, and actually out of this part of his book, I think on the foundations, it said quantum mechanics is complete in and of itself and no hidden variables theory can ex explain the measurement part of quantum mechanics. That's it, people. You're never going to get to the point of like, newton or maxwell or einstein it's just not going to happen he was wrong it turns out um there were people like niels bohr who kind of argued the same thing but just from a philosophical point of view you know basically we're talking about subatomic physics and you can't apply anthropomorphic ideas to subatomic physics it's just a different thing and just get used to it people um Einstein, who believed in relativistic causality, and he believed in Newton, he believed in Maxwell, you know, uh, those were the inspirations for his gravitation theory. And so he believed there's got to be these hidden variables. There's got to be a deeper dynamical theory that explains everything. We just don't know it, you know. Life is not probabilistic. Life is deterministic. Because determinism was the cornerstone of, of his thinking. So um, and, and and more than determinism, dynamical thinking, dynamical thinking, dynamical system theory, uh, dynamical modeling was where it was at for Einstein. So dynamical modeling requires you to have a complete set of state <laughs> variables, and those state variables undergo some time evolution. From the initial state, knowing the environment, you can you can describe the time evolution to get to a final state which is absolutely determined by that, that dynamical theory. It had to be that way. Um, so just to overview a little bit where we've come, there's the pedagogical challenge of just that the whole thing is kind of murky and that we don't, in terms of how it's taught, but just uh, in terms of the intuition, I think, I mean, there's the murkiness maybe of the subject. Then there is the... Um, 
challenge of like what we simply um well this uh, chasm this abyss between like what you're calling the dynamical systems and the measurement you know that there's these two different modes for understanding what's going on and they're just separate and there's uh no unity in the thinking and then furthermore like if we wanted to use some kind of human model for understanding this so we could you know just simply apply any kind of intuition um or even build up new intuition what would that be what would be those human concepts you know we need some kind of set of concepts so yes uh, i was in school uh around you know 40 years ago or whenever that was uh and so um I was at the University of Chicago. I think they did a good job, uh, at least uh, making that distinction, you know, that there's the theory, uh, what you call the dynamical system, and then there's the whole measurement problem. And those are like two different worlds, and it is a problem, you know. There's a problem with uh, having any sort of intuition. And so you have to think of, you know, work with different cases and build up that intuition. And maybe not exactly then, maybe more talking with you about this over, because it was always... Um, just um, unclear, you know, like, what is this? Uh, I just built up a personal intuition about uh, metaphysically, like, you know, there are, there's a world of possibilities, there's a world of actualities. And so what you call the dynamical system, that's a world of possibilities. And so all those possibilities, uh, they're all happening at once. Uh, they're all getting included, you know, like all paths are taken. Uh, you can have constructive interference, destructive interference. Uh, it's all on the level of possibilities. They have their own, you know, logic. But then you have a world of actualities. And so you pass over into the world that we're familiar with, which is a world of actualities. So, um, and so once I kind of just intuitively sorted that out mentally, uh, there wasn't really any um, clash, at least, uh, you know, cognitively. It's like, well, I mean, we're used to that distinction, you know, that's not a chasm that's unfamiliar. Uh, but I think whenever we spoke, like, you never found that satisfactory, like you had some kind of, uh, that was not a satisfactory solution, you know, for you, I think well, you had like a, a deeper, it's, it's, a, frame, about it. it's a framework, it, it's a framework that I think helps organize, you know, mm -hmm. thinking, but the reason why I'm not satisfied is because I think quite possibly there's a there is a layer that could be pulled back here. Um, and so you know, I think, in other words, a way of thinking that includes the dynamical mm -hmm. way of thinking, together with something else, but that something else is a bit less mysterious than just saying it doesn't exist, like in the case of von Neumann, or saying it doesn't matter, like in the case of mm -hmm. Bohr. Or, you know, or trying to doggedly, uh, you know, uh, hold fast to dynamical sy system thinking like Einstein. In other words, and we know that's wrong now, uh, you know. I didn't, I didn't so quite, maybe, maybe. I didn't quite maybe. get to the punchline here that, that, you know, 30 years or so after Einstein published his famous paper with Podolsky mm -hmm. and Rosen, Bell showed that what they were trying to describe, a, 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 lo a local hidden variable theory, would cannot cannot be could possibly be the case and be consistent with quantum mechanics. In other words, so, so you know, the development of this whole thing was, you know, there, there was this big confusion you know, and different philosophical points of view. By the way, Schrodinger was very much confused by the whole thing. Like, he, mm -hmm. I don't think he, he came down on one side or the other, but he, he just simply knew that the wave function was not a wave. Like, uh, it, it, <laughs> you know, um, and... I think just to add to, to what I'm saying, like, so once I made that kind of like... Um, you know, yeah, yeah. who am I? Like, how could I know? But once I made that kind of... Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry I kind of talked past you there. I, no, I, that's fine. Yeah. I, I just wanted to say um, the advantage of my um, coming to that point, I think, was that it says, look, the problem is not in either world. The problem is not having two worlds. The problem is the interface. It's it's a much more narrow problem. How do you get from the world of possibilities well, to I the world agree. of actualities? Yeah, I 
the the thing is so, so, maybe, maybe so, you, so, subtly, mm-hmm. you probably subtly influenced me because i believe that that's exactly what's going on i i believe that in 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 addressing that interface we can pull back a layer here that's what i yeah no i i'm in a i'm in complete i think so what's what's achieved there that, you're saying you know, you're maybe, saying that maybe, i never you're saying i never acknowledged that before and it might be you fought against that you just you just seemed like that was not sufficient but or was not helpful not relevant or whatever. but i think the point is is that don't well uh, once I'm you not, have I'm a model it. that is my thing i just want to say like once you have a model like that at least you can invest yourself mentally in those two worlds and not feel like you're just nowhere you're right. somewhere and then you can try to connect those two worlds whereas maybe in general most people they don't even have that you see yeah. they don't even have that and so they just they don't have any way of even distinguishing those two worlds or what so maybe that's uh well now that you now that you've kind of kind of uh push the issue i think i have to admit that i'm in agreement with you that it's the interface <laughs> so maybe we never talked about it in those terms or, or maybe i'm just slow you we know? did but this was like 30 years ago i think like uh, well, no, I was it, too, you know i mean i like, kind of remember pretty distinctly. If it only takes me 30 years to recognize something uh, <laughs> that's true i um <laughs> you know to make progress and that's maybe better than my average um but um well, so but um, maybe to oh, no, say I more, agree. I agree. your, your I intuition agree is with... deeper. So, what is the thing that is troubling well, you? Is, maybe if you could say more. Mm-hmm. I believe you know. So, to me, to me, you know, knowing that there's this conflict, and and knowing this conflict between possibility and actuality, I guess is. And, and that it's inherent in physics is really important to 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 recognize that that I think it was Bell that established beyond a doubt that that is a conflict and that it cannot be resolved within mm-hmm. with the current with the current theories that are being advanced by physics. Um, given given these notions of locality, right? Like which is uh, or non locality. Right, because what he showed is that. That basically there is no local hidden variables theory that can be, you know, satisfy relativistic invariance or rel- relativistic causality, if you want to call it, that um, that can give you the predictions of quantum mechanics. And then over the last thirty or thirty-five years, um, the this has been verified with exquisite pre- precision. I, you know, it's. In other words, you know, delayed choice experiments and so forth have, have reached, you know, kind of a uh, a high art. Uh, so, you know, if there is any kind of communication between the different entities being being measured in in these singlet experiments, mm-hmm. uh, where things are correlated but separated, you know, in a in a space like fashion. Uh, that the communication must be going f- like a hundred times the speed of light or a thousand times the speed of light. In other words, it's it's pretty clear that there's coordination going on or something that looks like coordination, yet there can't be like a a signal that, you know, some kind of a field or signal that mediates that that satisfies relativistic invariance. So, and so, it, so maybe just to state this thing called like the problem of, the collapse of the wave function using, I think, the words of the Copenhagen system, like the, the way I was taught, right? But like, right. which, you know, you, you don't want to think in those terms, but that there are thus all these, um, you know, four or five, 10, 20 uh, ways of interpreting quantum mechanics that are all just kind of like competing, etc. Now, first of all, there's this, this, and you're basically forming your own, you know, you're working towards a new interpretation, I would imagine. I think so. One that really distinguishes between classical and quantum modes, but uh, bef- so I want you to just dis- make that distinction. Um, but just to briefly say that distinction made between possibility and actuality already gives a way of looking at those theories and saying something like like the many worlds theory. Mm-hmm. It's not very satisfactory simply because it makes everything into possibility. It's like, well, there's all these possibilities. And it's just, that's all you need, right? And it just says, 
Well, then what's actuality? It doesn't say, and it just seems very unphysical because physics seems, um, it seems very wasteful. Why have all these universes? Yeah, I, don't, I don't know if even adherents of the many worlds theory say that it's going to be the ultimate theory, but I think that they tout certain, certain aspects of it. Like it does do a, it does do a resolution of the, of this, in other words, it gives you a mathematical. It it it, it, it is a it is a theory that where the mathematics is unitary evolution and it is relativistic invariant, and it, right. and it is consistent with. Okay, like, so so mathematically, so that all, that's almost that's it's just saying like mathematically, you just keep pushing this world right. of possibility. You, you just ignore the world of actuality in a certain right. sense. If and you're so, willing to, if you're willing, but to but that just seems completely metaphysically. Just like you, you're losing half your, you know, you're losing half your thing. And least, you, you're not least, explaining really the interface. Yes, I, I know. But at least it seems to be mathematically consistent. It, in other words, yeah. maybe the many worlds um, communities show that you can get a resolution, a mathematical resolution. Maybe you don't like it. Maybe it doesn't look like it. Okay, so, so well, that, maybe it's saying like that, that half of the equation is stands on its own basically yeah i my understanding of the many wheels theory is that it 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 is it it sweeps away those mysteries by adding so many <laughs> by adding <laughs> such a byzantine system so many hidden variables that you can make it work but that's a that's a mathematical breakthrough right you know, it's at least showing that mm -hmm. some kind of dynamical way of looking at things is can you know, in other words, dynamical thinking can encompass all all these. Yes, and, and another another thing to say just uh, before I I let you <laughs> proceed, but that in this Newtonian world of actuality, I mean, what what Schrodinger and 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 the gang um, accomplished was to say, look, you can mathematically, you know, in a physically meaningful way, quantify possibilities. You see, there's just a whole world of possibility, but it's not just metaphysical. Like it's actually quantifiable. Yes. It's actually, you know, mathematically describable. That's the shocking thing that you actually have, you know, now, but that then you've entered into this world of possibility where like the rules are all different. Like it's not going to be the world of actuality. It's going to be a different world, but right. you, you do have math and you, you can swim in that world. So, um, Right. And in a sense, Newton had the same problem, you know, the accuracy problem, right? The precision problem. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, the interface between actuality and possibility at least was less fraught, right? Because you could understand it in, in intuitive terms, why, you know, the actuality and the possibility would, would differ, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas there is no such uh, at least in standard quantum mechanics and in, in Copenhagen quantum mechanics, there is no attempt to bridge those at all. It is, you know, one world, uh, the, the actuality world and the possibility world don't even try. It's not, it, in other words, uh, Copenhagen basically says it's not a productive. In, in so depth, a, you know. a central theme in your thinking um, is this distinction between classical physics and quantum physics and then that uh, they're connected by a projection and i'm wondering maybe just intuitively if you could explain in your mind uh, what is the reality and the distinction between quantum yeah. and classical modes how so, do you draw that line so i mean i think that is a specific attempt to um to talk about this interface um and it came about, um, well, let me just say this. Uh, you know, I think I should talk in more generality before I talk about that, because that could be completely wrong, you know, right? Well, that's I, the interesting part. This is the exciting the, part. This exciting, is the part that... Yeah, well, it, we don't know whether it's right or wrong. So let's talk about the, just the general thing that I think is a, a useful enterprise, a worthwhile okay. enterprise. Um, first of all, I think many worlds is 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 great. I think bohm's model the bohmian david mm -hmm. bohm which, with the pilot wave is that the pilot wave you know which proved that von neumann <laughs> was wrong that there are dynamical theories it's just that they're non-local mm -hmm. and then 
and then Bell analyzing that to realize that, yeah, any any dynamical theory, statistical or deterministic dynamical theory has got to be non-local. Um, and, um, and then what are some other things? The spontaneous collapse theory. These are all, mm -hmm. these are all I think, um, valid and brilliant and interesting attempts to, to, to bridge this gap between actuality and and potential, you know, and 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 possibility. I think there, you know, so um, so my thinking is a bit like the spontaneous collapse theory. It's it's like you expand your dynamical system to a place where. And it, it, this is sort of based on an evolutionary model. In other words, there's some kind of selection going on here. There's some kind of a, you have a larger system, you have a larger world, and certain states are selected away. And they, and who's mediating the selection? I don't know. You know, I mean, who's, who's mediating the laws of physics? You know, it's, it's a, but you know, so if you have a larger dynamical system that all this is playing out in, but you're only seeing part of it, you're only seeing the part that's been curated, that's been culled or selected, you think you're in a world where that's all consistent. But in fact, there's this larger um, puppeteer, you might call it, that is playing out in a larger dynamical system and only allowing you to see, in other words, only allowing certain states to survive through some kind of a calling process or selection process. So it's more of an evolutionary model of, of what we're actually seeing when we do observations and experiments. There's something behind the curtain. So it's not unlike any of these other models right this the the, the i would say that uh, many worlds model says that yeah the the what's behind the curtain of these you know this huge multitude of of worlds that are going in parallel what's behind the spontaneous collapse theory is another dynamical um edifice that is beyond the schrodinger equation yet gives you the you know does the bridging um, in a way, this idea is very similar. It's saying that there's a larger dynamical system where everything's playing out, but things are getting selected away so that we see only, you know, a slice of it, what I call the cold rep representation of it. Now, um, so here's what I think about the interface between actuality and possibility. If you can make sense of that interface, in a way that is logical, impersonal, and simple. Simple in the sense that it doesn't require the mind, a, some kind of universal mind, mm -hmm. to, to work out the to work out the to work out the the mathematics. In other words, something is happening. Yet it's fairly simple to describe mathematically. And when I say simple, I mean like on the on the order of what how physics is simple, like Maxwell's equations are simple or Einstein's. They're not they're not simple from the lay person's point of view, but they're simple from the idea of mathematics. In other words, there's a equation that can be written down in less than half a page that dictates, or some kind of a some kind of a system, mathematical system that can be written down in a compact form that doesn't go on for three thousand pages. Uh, that that d describes the underlying mechanism. So something simple, something impersonal. Um, impersonal in the sense that it acts sort of the same way in every situation it li that's like it. In other words, it doesn't have to particularize to a, you know, uh, Andrews is doing the experiment, John's doing the experiment. Right. I have there's a symmetry it. behind it. Right. Mm -hmm. There's a certain symmetry behind it. it it's portable, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's portable, yeah. it's Equivalent. simple, mm -hmm. it's it's impersonal in the sense of portable, maybe a better way of putting it, and it's and it's and it's 
compact mathematically. And if you can describe the interface in that way, then I would say that that's a successful physical theory. It may not be true. It may be that there's a better physical theory, but at least it's, well, no, it's a plausible physical theory. I don't know about successful. But, but that, that quest is, I would say, inherent uh, in each of those models, uh, but in all of physics, the idea that you can focus on a subsystem and it'll be valid with regard to the whole system. So like, you know, you can think of the earth and the sun as a system. You can add the moon, let's say, right? But you don't have to worry about uh, the, the the surrounding stars or the other planets or whatever. That So essential to physics, like, you know, you can ignore friction. Uh, you can or ignore air resistance. Central to physics is this whole idea that it's kind of additive and that you can... Um, take systems you can have a system take it up yeah, yeah. so that has never really been explained you know like and i think no. you're saying like if there was a good explanation also when i was um making uh epistemology of physics i sketched it out and the central you know what are the ways of figuring things out in physics the central way seemed to be faraday's pale basically that like if you put your charges in a pail or something like you're able to, it's physically possible, let's say, and, and desirable to isolate a system um, and then to see what happens, let's say, you know, or at least to to play with that whole notion. That seems to be the central way of thinking in physics. The way to the classic observer in physics is going to be operating on that type of level. Uh, yeah. So so I think I think this way of thinking that that is attracted to me attempts to peel that back, attempts to describe a world and describe a dynamics that can be embedded in a larger dynamics and yet the the smaller dynamics the the more uh, proximate dynamics is self-consistent in other words and, there's not so much feedback from the larger dynamics as to make mm -hmm. the the smaller dynamics not consistent you know in other words or, or at least uh, it is um you can uh it doesn't dominate let's say like the feedback like you're able to uh you're able to make meaningful study analysis of the smaller system even given uh so let's say some noise or some feedback or some you know, right. interplay between the that's right and so, that's right i, think, um, yeah. I think lurking in lurking in your picture maybe in all these pictures is this idea of um it's not a single system like it's not a single set, it's a set of subsets. You know, there's a power set there, or maybe not power sets, the wrong word, but there's like a topology. There's a set of open sets, so to speak, or enclosed sets, you know. There's a there's a way of culling out the sets and saying, well, these are the open sets in this topology that are relevant, let's say, and the other ones, they're just not relevant for this topology. But but what are the, what's the uh, system of, what's the collection of subsystems that are real? You know, and that are relevant, let's say, and that are plausible, possible, mm -hmm. you know, potentially actual, let's say, or you know, that's some kind of context like that. You're, you're, uh, yeah. And so, I, we, yeah, I'm definitely, definitely trying to describe like a hierarchy like that that would, or at so least, maybe at least a pro approximate hierarchy. It's like, a, like you say, there is feedback from the larger to the smaller, but it's done in such a way that the smaller theory is a good theory that allows for enough consistent survivability over time to create kind of a um, a narrative, you know, a consistent narrative over time, you know. And, and you, another theme, and we'll get to this, but like you talk about agency hierarchies, where there's all these levels of agency, and certainly if, you know, given the attempts to explain the role of the observer in the measurement process, you know, and what exactly do you need to be an observer, you know, like, uh, but I think that there's this whole world of interplay, but maybe launching off into, into uh, all of your concepts, I would like you to define in your mind, how do you think of the difference between classical physics and quantum physics intuitively? And then how do you propose to connect that or how do you see the connection? Yeah, so so it's strange that, um, okay, so I'm going to try to address this directly, but I have to kind of talk about a little bit of context here. Please. Um, so in my investigation, the, the idea is you look at a larger dynamics 
and that um, you try to you try to uh, f find a plausible larger dynamics it has a smaller dynamics embedded in it is sort of this self-consistent or consistent enough uh, system that can operate on its own, be its own theory, be its own good theory, okay? Um, so, so I'd like to go to biology just real quick. You know, the, the mm -hmm. idea would be if you, if you, and again, my guiding light is biology. It, it is evolution that if you see, if you see order in a, in a system, that's a telltale sign that there was some kind of a selective process that got you there. Some kind of a natural selection that got you there. So we see the laws of physics, for example. My feeling is that, you know, if we ever understand things in entirety and physics becomes this known dead subject, we're going to understand where the laws of physics came from. And my intuition is that they came from some kind of a selected selection process that came from something larger and they were selected down because and, and so that would that would include the physical constants but it would also include like the uh power laws it would include equations everything yeah, everything yeah okay uh okay so in other words it's not predetermined that it was this way it got here through some evolutionary process and so you know what happens in a niche in, in a biological niche where you know evolution is a is a seems to be a very good predictor for the fact that there's niches and and a lot of a lot of biological order in the world um, and very very elaborate biological structures in a niche you have an organism that kind of lives in its own isolated world in a sense it can predict that world it can live in that world for example, some seashore creature, maybe a crustacean or a bird or something that knows the way those waves move, uh, lives on that environment, knows enough about that environment to survive long enough, and can predict things long enough to, to pass on offspring and so forth. Now, the environment sometimes rears its ugly head. You have, uh, you have droughts, you have a change in the environment, or or just the environment itself does feed back into the niche. The niche isn't entirely isolated, but it's isolated enough that you can operate within that environment in a productive way, in a in a in a way that perpetuates the the structure, the species, the the whatever's filling that niche. Not a perfect predictor, but good enough for that environment. So um and what happens when the environment feeds back? Well, you get culling, you get a you get a, a reduction in certain varieties of organisms filling that environment. That a when, euphemistic, but okay. But that, euphemistic for extinction, but well, it but might be a particle, know. might be an extinction of certain genes, but but um, opening up opening up the niche for other genes. So there, I, I just. So it goes empathizing with those crabs. That's all right. I'm sorry. Yeah, no. And you know, so so why is there extinctions? Why is there culling? Why is there selection going on? Because you know, it's not a per you know, niches are not perfect. You know, if you lived in a perfect niche, you'd be able to isolate your own world from the rest of the world, everything would be predictable and so forth. So you accept that there's some feedback coming from a larger system that's not described within the niche itself. And that provides some kind of a selection process for what ends up being in that niche. But it's just not a, just a question to throw you off into the thing. But can can these tests work both ways? Like, you know, I've been in situations where I failed the test, but I thought it was maybe a failure of the test as well. Like, you know, can it be that a niche fails, that a niche gets extinguished or made extinct or whatever? Does it work that way, possibly, or not? I don't know. Yeah. Like, you know, every test is a test of both. It's a test of the one who takes the test, but it's a test of the one who gives the test. You could probably find examples of that in, you know, pol political economics and so forth. You know, like, in other words, uh, you, you, you make a remedy, some kind of remedy to 
eliminate a program or or you know devalue a certain way of thinking or change course and it ends up having all these side effects on the on the big picture in other words you know auto well, maybe, maybe maybe a practical example like a niche that becomes barren but it may be changed by let's say there's successful niches around it they change the chemical composition of the atmosphere the atmosphere changes that you know like these the dead niches may get reformed basically oh yeah yeah but also okay. there's autoimmune diseases right there's there's bad there's bad selection going on sometimes mm -hmm. um, in other words it it the whole thing is well, the niche could be destroyed that's also kind of a right shit show, but it it kind of works for for long periods of time you know it's uh in in biology it's rather a a messy business you know and in physics it's I, probably um, not so messy it's probably i took us astray but i just yeah. wanted to okay so okay. biology is sort of the is sort of the um sort of the wellspring of uh inspiration here but you know so mm. how can you apply that to physics and in particular in quantum mechanics you know uh, typically the way it's looked at is quantum mechanics is the ultimate theory uh in in you know uh subcontext of quantum mechanics is classical mechanics classical mechanics is the approximate theory that comes out of quantum mechanics and you know the Aaron Fest theorem is kind of an expression of that um Born's rule and the Aaron Fest theorem and 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 basically that you can derive Newton's equation from the Schrodinger equation with certain superpositions you know of of, of wave functions and uh so yeah you you know it looks like quantum is the ultimate theory um so I guess at some point, I decided to turn that around and think of classical as the larger context and quantum as a sub subcontext. And and you know, I had my reasons for doing it. It was just basic, in, in, intuitive, you know, like what if kind of thing. And um, interesting things come out of that. Um, first of all, how could you possibly get quantum mechanics from classical mechanics? I mean, it's they seem just completely different dynamical theories. And so um, the way of doing that is you view quantum states as being certain kinds of classical. First of all, classical states, you have to expand to uh, a description of classical mechanics. It's more, more of a Lagrangian or Hamiltonian or ultimately a unitary dynamics. You have to think of classical states as being functions over position and momentum space. Now, typically uh, a point particle would be just a, a, uh, a delta function, you know, in other words, particular position, particular momentum, you know, particular mass. So mass is at, Perfectly yeah. specified. Perfectly specified. That would be a point particle. But you could also talk about distributions of particles, you know, that, um, uh, or a, an object that's like a continuum. We know that such a thing, such things don't exist in, in reality, but, you know, um, you can do a thought experiment and say that your object is spread out over position space and momentum space. A little bit you know so you have a maybe a very tightly packed gaussian and then you look at what are the what are the rules that uh that determine the time evolution of that function and that's called the von neumann um koopman dynamics kvn koopman von neumann dynamics and basically it's just newton's equation but applied to uh, multiple points in space to get, you know, the evolution of functions, what they would look like under Newtonian flow in the underlying phase space. And that's a Koopman von Neumann model. And that's a unitary model of classical mechanics. And it's equivalent to classical mechanics. So it's a, you know, in, in mechanics, you can describe things as points moving around space. You can describe them in a Lagrangian way. You can describe them in a Hamiltonian way. You can describe them in a unitary way. These all end up being equivalent in classical mechanics. The thing about classical is that it allows for specification of momentum and position separately. You can specify some smeared out blob over position, over, you know, region of space, 
uh, both in terms of region, spatial region, and momentum, you know, what its possible mom momenta are, smeared out momentum. And, uh, you know, in reality, that's kind of how we view our measurement process, right? We don't know exactly where a particle is, you know, we know very precisely where it is, you know, to a certain level of precision. We know, don't know exactly what its momentum is. So in a sense, what we're really dealing is a tightly packed Gaussian and that um, our predictions will spread out over time. You know, the Gaussian will have some kind of a dispersion and, and, uh, and, and this will take place in the real numbers that this is all described in the real numbers. is probably just distributions over P mm -hmm. and X, you know, over position momentum position. And the dynamics that describe that, you know, that describe the evolution of that of that uh, probability distribution are the KVN dynamics. They're 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 uh, the Koopman von Neumann equations. Very easy to write down. It's a first order differential equation. Super simple, simpler than Schrodinger's equation. But you know, so my idea was that what if we look at a subspace of um, functions over p and p and x, where um, multiplication by p is equivalent to differentiation by x, which is what you get out of quantum mechanics, right? In oh, quantum okay. mechanics, you don't separately specify p and x. I see. You oh. add this. So, given the independence, then you add another constraint, saying and like. The, and the constraint would be the would be the uh, constraint that when you multiply by p the set of functions by p it's equivalent to uh, negative h bar times i times differentiation by x. So there's a certain subspace of of um, functions of p and x where that is true, and it's a subspace that looks like a function of p times e to the i x p over h bar. In other words, these are functions that have a particular, they're, they're, you can specify momentum freely as a function of p, but then x occurs in a very rigid way um, in that function. It's, it's, it's a particular function of, of p and x. So essentially, these are functions that are sort of uniform over space. They fill up all of space, but you can specify momentum to whatever degree of accuracy you want. And this and, is what... and so you've been in recent videos, uh, you've been giving a mathematical framework for quantum mechanics. And so it's very central to that is this ability to go back and forth between position space and momentum space using the Fourier transform and then the yeah. inverse Fourier transform. And so you're saying that's all extra that's uh, thrown on there and well, it's all consequential it's all a consequence of this view of configuration space this 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 view of restricting yourself to a place mm -hmm. where multiplication by p looks like differentiation by x in other words you're it, restricted to a mm -hmm. very very high dimensional high co-dimensional subspace of and of, just as a just as a very much fringe uh, note to add, like because I've been studying these orthogonal Sheffer polynomials, and they are also like taking uh, two constraints. You know, one is uh, orthogonality, the other is Sheffer, the Sheffer where the this family, uh, infinite family of polynomials, uh, when you look at its generating function, it will be built on two power series related by an exponential. So it'd be a of t times e to the x u of t. So if you thought of that U of T as having a complex number in it, let's say, or something like that, then all of a sudden it's it, it's kind of wanting to be friends with your theory. Maybe, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, I, I think it'd be interesting to build some bridges there if we can, but uh, so, okay, without getting too technical here, there there's, there's a way of looking at quantum configuration space as a subset of classical configuration space. A subspace, a very high co-dimensional, infinite co-dimensional subspace. Configuration space for classical allows you to specify things with, with ultimate precision. It doesn't satisfy the uncertainty principle. The uncertainty principle does not plague classical configuration space. It does plague quantum configuration space. Okay. 
so this is basically equivalent to looking at quantum mechanics in momentum space rather than position space. It's, it's absolutely equivalent. So the question is, where did the Schrodinger equation come from? Is it somehow related to the classical time evolution? Like if the larger space evolves according to this KVD, K VN dynamics, you know, which is basically Newton's mm -hmm. dynamics, but expressed in, in terms of unitary, the, the unitary framework. Um, does quantum mechanics somehow comport with that? And the answer is yes. In free space, they're the same theory. Up to, a f except for a factor of two in time. Mm -hmm. And this factor of two is like the flag of your investigation. Like, you know, you're trying to. Yeah. So why does quantum. That, that, if you can explain that, you'll really feel like your uh, yeah, theory so quantum, has so uh, some kind of so, tangibility. So, so to make sense of them, you need this projection that takes you from the larger space uh, where P and X can be freely uh, controlled to the quantum space where x is very rigidly in there uh, and this projection can be written down as a mathematical formula it's like a transform type formula it involves a fourier transform and a and a and some other uh, some other ingredients but um if you take classical if you take a quantum state and you evolve it according to classical dynamics and then you project back down to quantum you get the Schrodinger equation. Okay. Now you can also do that in non-free space. Uh, it takes a slightly more elaborate projection, but not very not very complicated. You can evolve according to Schrodinger and project. I mean, evolve according to Newton and then project back down. Unfortunately, you don't get Schrodinger, <laughs> but you get to first order in time Schrodinger. In other words. Um, you know, for um, it doesn't quite work for non-free space. And I used to think that was a flaw, like if I could just find the right projection, then, then I could do it. But I think it's actually a feature. And it's, the reason why it's a feature is this factor of two in time. Um, so here's the model. The model is that you've got some subspace of of phenomena you have some subspace of and you associate these usually with subatomic phenomena subatomic particles they're completely spread out in space you know according to e the i x p over h bar like the if you take the modulus of that wave function it's uniform in space these things are spread out over all space which is kind of a problematic concept right um but you evolve them according to Newtonian dynamics. And then you look at the results in that subspace. And in free space, you get the Schrodinger equation with a factor of two in time. And the relationship is this. Classical is going twice as fast as quantum. Quantum um, seems to be slower, sluggish compared to classical. And the same thing with that first order theory, if you have modified space, if you have if you have a potential in space, you get, again, this factor of two. Um, so where's the factor of two come from? And then it occurred to me that that might be the result of a calling. In other words, certain states are being selected out from us and we're not observing them. They're happening in some larger context. And that context, is just the classical dynamical framework. Now, I'm not absolutely sure that the classical dynamical framework is going to work, you know, for Dirac equation or even the Schrodinger equation with with a non-zero potential. Uh, I'm not convinced yet until I can figure out more about the calling, you know. And, uh, and you've been going for the last few years, like deep into mathematically 
modeling these whole kind things and work, yeah. kind of going through the inners and using all your power as a functional analyst and yeah yeah and all yeah. types of analysis your love of well, Fourier yeah, analysis I've been, around. Yeah. I've been just, I'm just... But, but listening to what you're saying now um it brings to mind like what that culling process could look like if you have these two worlds half of what's going on is you have this uh, classical um mechanics and you're just selecting out saying look I'm going to add this constraint. And so uh, I'm just going to end up with a smaller world, which will be the quantum world where, you know, everything obeys this additional thing that ends up being more or less like Schrodinger's equation, let's say, right? But now imagine if then you reconstruct, you go back to the classical mechanics by saying, well, the classical world is built up from the quantum world. You see, the only part of classical world that's quote unquote real or actual or relevant is the part that can be built up back from the quantum. But now you have a new, you see, classical world. And now from that classical world, you can put on again, let's say, this uh, layer, and you may get a more narrow quantum world or not, or slightly different. I don't know. But the idea is that if you had this process sloshing back and forth, you see, and that might be mathematically in category theory an adjunction, you see, where yes, you I have this. Thought, I haven't thought in terms of multi layered like that. I've only, I, I'm only well, just going back and forth, up and down, yeah. like you know, you're yeah. you're keep you keep making the world smaller, smaller, smaller in the quantum world, and you keep it becomes more defined, it becomes more restricted as you go. You know, if you the culling in a certain sense is going when you go from classical to quantum, it's just saying, look. Things have to be quantized, you know, things have to obey the Schrodinger equation, things have to. But then it's saying, okay, but then the classical world is only going to be what you can build from that. Those will be your building blocks for the classical world, let's say. So it may be, That's it, unlikely it's real. And yeah, then so you go back with a smaller world and then back and back. That would be an evolutionary process. Maybe. Uh, so I haven't I haven't thought about, you know, kind of this bidirectionality. Um, you know, what... So, what are the you think about a system like this, and what are the constraints on it? So that looking at the smaller world, looking at the quantum world or the the more restricted world, you would end up with a consistent theory, like a like a Schrodinger dynamics or a Dirac dynamics. Um, what are the, what are the what are the constraints? Well, and then one of one of the are you have an answer to that, or I have a thought. Well, no, I, I, but but this is kind of what guides me is that you are always looking for some kind of a uh, you know relationship, and part of it is the mathematical relationship. This kind of projection that I'm speaking of, this projection would allow you to um, take what's happening in the larger world and interpret it in the smaller world. And so then, then but you going... need. Projection together with a process that removes roughly half of the states. Well, precisely half of the states. Well, this is for that. This is for that too, right? And, and those states, and and then my my intuition is that the states that are removed are the ones that would make the smaller theory inconsistent. In other so, words, the inconsistencies are dealt with in the calling. And so, and and also, like that factor of two may be the. Uh, result of trillions of iterations absolutely you know, let's say right but you know of going let's say through this type of sloshing back and forth but in terms of describing that going up from the quantum to the classical there's an idea in your conceptual uh toolkit um, that's maybe super relevant which is the idea of learning so uh you've explained that like when you have these dynamical systems learning is taking place when the dynamical system gets chunked, I think very much in the way that we've been talking about subsystems. You know, when you're able right. to pop out the subsystem, right, which is the whole point of physics in the way we've been talking about it, right? Like, So when you go down to the quant, so maybe you start with a classical world where like everything's connected, everything's related. There's no sense in talking about a subsystem because it's all one system, right? But then you drop down to the quantum world and you kind of, quantize things and they become you lose that binding you lose that relationship where everything's related to everything else and see as you lose that relationship you can start to have subsystems where they're they pop out they don't need to be connected to absolutely everything or or they can be connected as a subsystem 
you know, and the individual, you know, with a center of mass, let's say, right? Like the sun can be a center of mass from the big picture point of view, and people don't need to think about the individual electrons or protons or neutrons. Um, so this going up and down this and back and of, forth. This is this is sort of the inspiration um, that that the that there's some larger dynamical thing going on in the universe, or some kind of larger evolutionary thing, but it chunks into smaller things, and but that chunking is not perfect. Um, and and this is a perfect, little bit. You wouldn't need any calling at all because there, you would have a perfect subsystem that that it, it affected the larger system, but the larger system did not feed back into the subsystem. In other words, you get an upper triangular dynamics where the smaller system in the lower right hand corner uh is has a zero right next to it and um but i'm saying that to have a successful evolutionary system you don't need that all you need is a limit on the feedback from the larger environment to the smaller mm -hmm. environment so it's not total chaos in the smaller environment just a, a restriction on the feedback Right, research on the so feedback. that it's not overwhelming. The it seems from this factor of two that that has popped up that that restriction is that the the larger environment and the smaller environment. If you look at the dynamics in each one of them, the average surprisal rate using the smaller uh, between the two, um, something called callback information, maybe. Mm -hmm. Relevant quantity here, it's sort of like a generalized entro entropy measure, is is one half. One half the time. And and certainly in, in a month, um, we'll want to have you meet up with um Daniel uh, Ari Friedman is a new participant in Math for Wisdom uh, with a PhD in biology, and he's president of the Active Inference Institute, which is based on active inference, which is uh based on the free energy principle and the minimization of surprise and things like that. We also have a PhD in biophysics, uh, Jerry Northrup, with his relational symmetry paradigm, which is very much uh, centered around uh, the maximum entropy principle. So your interest in biology, I think it would be very nice uh, if they watch this video to see where these evolutionary ideas could connect. But I wanted to add a couple of thoughts, though, that uh, one is uh, in the interpretation of quantum mechanics that let's say Penrose and some of his colleagues like, which is the spontaneous collapse where, oh, yeah. uh, like, let's say it's thermodynamical. I think that's been shown. That's probably not going to work, but let's say Penrose thinks it's gravity, let's say. But I would think like, um, based on my studies of the Oneida lemma and like automata theory, like when you get enough, um, when a system grows enough in terms of its relationships, it doesn't want to be a direct automata anymore. It would prefer to be like a pushdown automata, just because in terms of the, the weight of the building, you know, as the system grows and the number of relationships grows, just coordinating all those uh, rela growing relationships becomes much, it's better to have things become kind of submodular, modular. So there's like a global quantum, like there's a maximum that a system would want before it wants to start to break up. Now, what you're describing is actually in the opposite direction. It's explaining like how you can chunk things down, I think, like, you know, like, how how does it work in the opposite direction? So either way, though, that, that may be a relevant concept. I did spend some time uh, returning today to David Griffith's book, where he talks about that factor of two very early. Uh, he talks about the quantum harmonic oscillator. And, I mean, not, not, even before that, he talks about the uh, infinite well. Then he talks about the free wave packet. And in just like five, six pages, he goes through what you talk through in, let's say, five hours, but, you know, with none of the mathematical uh, background, mm. but like in two sentences, he goes from position space to momentum space and back, let's say, right? and just a, but not explaining that this is even position, he just calls it K, you know, I mean, momentum, he just calls it K. But they, what is the whole point is uh, he he very clear to say there's a difference between um, the velocity of the ripples, which would be... Um, the, the phase velocity oh, okay. and the velocity of the envelope which would be the group velocity mm -hmm. and the idea is that uh, in different media and different situations uh, they could be the same or one could be bigger than the other one so he'll say like if you wave a string that'll be the same group velocity and phase velocity the ripples and the and the envelope will go the same but uh, crucially like if you throw a pebble in still water and it makes ripples 
Then um, the ripples, let's see, how does it go? The envelope velocity, the group velocity, is one half the ripple velocity. And what that means, it means that the ripples, when they go out, they go out fast and they're going from the inside of the overall energy to the outside. Mm. Okay, so it's going, the ripples are going faster. They're like the medium and they're carrying this envelope of water, let's say, or energy or heightened activity. Mm. But in the quantum case, it will be the opposite. Mm. You see, it will be that the, um, the, the envelope is going faster than the ripples. Now, I thought about what that could mean, and, and he explains mathematically very precisely why that is. And the reason is, is because when you have a X times momentum, let's say minus uh, frequency times time, the relationship between frequency omega and, let's say, K uh, time momentum is that uh, omega would be linear, K would be quadratic. Mm -hmm. So when you're comparing omega and K, if you compare one way, you will get like omega to k will give you the speed of the ripples but delta omega to delta k will give you the speed of the um envelope right and so because it's a k squared quadratic that's where the factor of two comes in according to that and so right. it's because of that but what i wanted to say um one thing i noticed was that uh, if you think of causality the one that is going faster is the one that is let's say the medium like when you have water waves and you have the ripples, they're coming in and they're going through and you feel causally that they're carrying the envelope, right? Like that they are the thing that's real is the ripples and the envelope is built on top of them and it's a caused by the ripples. But if the envelope is faster, you see, then the ripples are coming in and going out. The envelope is moving through them. And so the envelope, the cause the ripples you know it, the envelope made the ripples happen so when i have my cognitive framework the five somewhere it says like for decision making there's two directions of causality every effect going backwards has had its cause of that effect but not every cause going forward has had its effects from that cause and there's a critical point for deciding so this idea that in one world let's say maybe the classical world you know, in one view, let's say, just to make it more simple or neutral, in one view, the causality is coming from the uh, ripples to the envelope. And in the other view, it's going the other way. And so maybe there's two ways to think about it. Yeah. But I'm, I was just curious, like, what's your analysis of Griffith's, you know, explanation? Because he seems to deal with it. He seems to think it's well, that's very a, important. That's, that's the way I, that, I mean... From a physical point of view, that's exactly the way I think about it. I mean, I I, I mm -hmm. think in the standard physics terms, and um, and certainly the the factor two that I'm talking about does come from the the that relationship between phase and it's group. basically the same. It it's is, the same yeah. thing. It's, it's but you're just coming with a different interpretation of that in terms a bit of, of a di the yeah, it's a different of the interpretation. Process. It's a different interpretation, and so um, I mean, if you wanted to make a like a temporal model of this and i and, and and it was really discussions with you that really motivated me to think try to think deeply about this and the best i could come up with is that if you're sending stuff out twice as fast mm -hmm. as it should be then from a relativistic point of view that's gonna that's gonna run into trouble um you know an observer say going with the group velocity along with the wave is going to see one outcome and the observer going with the phase velocity of the wave may see a completely different outcome uh, because they're looking at sort of different energetic pictures from different reference frames and they may not agree on which site was activated in other words there might be some disagreement oh a dot happened here a dot happened here and and you know, in my reference frame, you know, the first dot that got activated by this by this um, quantum perturbation was this one over here. And in a different re reference frame, it, it appears to be a different dot. In other words, there's an inconsistency that gets built up there. Along comes the master puppeteer and says that cannot hold in, in the observational world with consistent history. So one of the one of you has to go. Now but 
but it's more like a reset. In other words, this thing did okay. not result in two reference frames, one at the group velocity and one at the phase velocity agreeing, and therefore the whole thing gets reset. And so there's this factor of two overhead in terms of measurement in the end. The factor of two because there's two reference frames? Because there's two reference frames, one at the group, and and so one, it... one at the phase velocity and one at the group velocity. Um, so in other words, what site gets activated may depend on the reference frame. They may, in my hypothesis, they agree half the time and they disagree the other half of the time. And the half the time they di disagree, the master puppeteer set, hits a reset signal and the whole thing starts over again. So in other words, the history gets cold. The, this inconsistent history gets cold away. And so with, without this, just so that I could think I could understand, without this, the group velocity and the phase velocity would be the same. But with this, the, 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 the ripples go half as slow. The phase velocity goes half as slow. But otherwise, it would, you're claiming it would be the that's same. A way of, that's a way of thinking about it, yeah. See, because the way when I read what he's saying, it's kind of like I just take it at face value. Okay, that's what the math says, no, right? No. And so, see, so, so see, the, I'm just just say like he's basically saying like in the real world, the actual world, let's say, you are going faster than the ripples, so the ripples are not going to be a problem. It's all about the you know what's happening with your envelopes. Now, Schrodinger's equation is not relativistic, so already like you're going to have problems from that. Yes. And it's actually maybe the very thing that we talked about that, like the fact that uh, omega frequency and momentum have this relationship, linear versus quadratic. You see, that maybe is the thing that, like, that's just not going to jive with relativistic thing in the first place. So, from that point of view, it's like this equation is not really workable, anyways. You know, you, it doesn't apply and just forget about it. Whereas you're saying, um, but no, you're saying, I'm going to keep this, but I'm going to explain totally backwards you know like how did we get here that we started with a phase velocity and ripple velocity being the same maybe you're basically saying like how did you get this bifurcation of the classical world and the quantum world how did they become two separate worlds this is basically what you're describing that they became two separate they were originally one world where, where they were at one speed then all of a sudden you're getting two different kinds of uh things you're getting and they're different by a factor of two. And that was the process of an evolutionary process, which went from one to two. I think, Am I understanding you I kind so. of? Or? I think that's that's more or less what I'm getting at. And, you know, all this stuff, this physical model that I just I, I just described is vague. It, mm -hmm. it's, it's, a, it's an anthropomorphized kind of way of thinking, like, how could this culling happen? How could, how could this editing of histories occur? Like, what is the mind of the puppeteer, you know? Um, so, you know, in a sense, it's like a provisional way of thinking that it, it gives you some intuition. Really what I think, you know, maybe a bit less fraught way of thinking about it, um, is that, is that these, you know, there are inherent inconsistencies in in these states these quantum states inherent inconsistencies um that require if you're going to have a consistent physics if you're going to have like something that you can call physics you have to resolve these inconsistencies in other words um the, the, Maybe I the, could the classical if, oh. the, the classical the larger dynamics has embedded in it um evolutions time evolutions that are not consistent with looking at the smaller niche in other words the smaller niche would not make sense and 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 but that assumes that there is some vantage point where taking a niche and bringing it out and observing it all kind of like is reasonable and makes sense, you know, to not just have one totally densely intermeshed system where nothing can pop out, you know, but like right. that in order to have that, in order to have physics, so to speak, 
And so here's where wondrous wisdom. In order to have wondrous, histories, in order to in order to in deal order with to have histories. So where like wondrous wisdom comes in is like we have uh, we start with a state of contradiction, like God is God. You know, is a state of all contradiction. All things are true. And then how do you layer, you know, through divisions of everything, through self-differentiation, how do you get this uh, enrichment of, let's say, that original state of contradiction where it is able to support a very tentative, fragile, consistent state of non-contradiction? And it's a, it takes seven steps, so to speak. And so the fourth step is this idea of, let's say, knowledge. Knowledge needs a differentiation between whether, what, how, why. So in what you're describing, there's the medium, and there's the um, phenomenon, let's say, right? Like, so the, the envelope is the phenomenon, and it's observable, and it's real, but it's passing over a medium that's kind of like making it, uh, you know, through these, these ripples of the medium, or vice versa, right? So who whose mind is that in, right? Like, you need a mind that's able to distinguish those two levels, right? Or you need a frame or whatever, like where those, you know, coordinate system, you know, whatever you want to call it, but you need something that distinguishes. And that's just the what and the how, you could say. Like, but then maybe there's also like so maybe the medium is the how and then the the, the phenomenon is the what. But then that suggests there's also a why and a whether somewhere implicit in there, you know, hidden in there. And then once you have that, then you can have decision making, you can have time and space, you can have like causality going forward and backward, those five states that I talked about, right? And then you could have, let's say, a moral point of view, and then you could have like a logical system. So there's this, and before you even have knowledge, you need to have some kind of participation. So this idea like participation is basically what allows you to have a subsystem, which is being and doing and reflecting, you know, and able to do all that. Or you need, need to have existence before that, like where things can exist uh, somehow, right? So, and some kind of global notion of order, like all these things are somehow implicit. And what you're, so just to conclude this tangent, but like what you're basically coming up with is these contradictions that you're very sensitive to are the guide. And that contradictions include this difference between the phase velocity and the group velocity, the envelope and uh, I mean the ripples and the envelope. Well, and, also, and you say there's something there. So ultimately, relativistic invariance. You know the the fact that you you can get states in the larger system that um, that don't comport with the smaller system. In other words, there's there's um, you know. There's inconsistency built into it that is mediated somehow. And that mediation process I call calling or edit, editing of histories. Um, and you know, from a from a physical point of view, the question is what is the big hang up here in understanding quantum mechanics? And I guess what I'm saying is kind of time, you know, time is the big hang up. Um, in other words, our histories are laid down by some combination of dynamical time, you know, which we feel like we understand in terms of like a space-like dimension and some kind of a selection process. In other words, editing out of histories that, that, that are not consistent with, with, uh, and so like in your ontology, th this notion of history is very real. And you say that their histories are basically formed and then they're just, some of them are extinguished. You know, some of them are culled, like you say, some of them are, and some of them persist. And so that's a whole basis. That's what like the foundation for an evolution of physics. Yeah. Era. And, you know, then, and one model for that is what I called the agency machine that I did. Mm -hmm showed you that where if you had agency over calling you could make well if you if you had control over the calling process you can make uh, a coin flip 20 times in a row on heads um if you could can you, can you briefly you, explain like how that would well, work I mean, the idea is pretty simple that if if you could hit a button that did reset um, and then you put instructions, hit this button every time you see a tail. And, and then stop when you get 20 heads in a row. 
Um, then um, then you could, and it really did just sort of reset time every time you did that and reset the flip, then, you, you know, internally it looks like Oh, well, you're just doing all these flips, but you're getting rid of these, you know, these, mm -hmm. uh, the flips that you did not like, the outcomes you did not like. Externally, it looks like you flip the coin 20 times in a row. In other words, in your timeline, oh, maybe a million years went by. I don't know how long it would take. Um, there was a, say, a flip every, mm -hmm. every, every five seconds. In someone else's timeline, where those histories got edited away, it looks like you just did twenty flips in a row, and it was mm -hmm. and it was just by the presence of this machine. The machine never got pushed; never it was just sitting there in the room. It's like that machine had agency over the flips. I see. So that's you know, how you're saying that there's and there is some scientific evidence for the effects of just like the presence of a machine. Like you know, it does not have to be run, but just the fact that it's part of the setup. Yeah, so we'd have to look at those. It's influencing yeah. the outcomes. We'd have to look at Is those. Is that correct? Or? Yeah. No, I, you know, I think some of those delayed outcome experiments have that flavor, but they're not exactly what I'm saying. I, I don't think, I don't think there is an agency machine. I don't, I don't think. See, but do I don't, you believe that there could be, or do you think not? Or you're afraid well, of I that? Believe, I think that's one of your, I mean, one of your weird, anxieties. It'd be, it'd be strange, you know, I mean, stranger things that, you know, I mean, physics is maybe stranger than physics fiction but um i don't uh, my my hypothesis is that we don't have that level of agency we don't oh, you think that that may be outside of our and maybe we can go outside of whatever this context is what, that we're in but we're in a context where we do not have that that agency. but nature could have that agency you think it could. like it's you possible know, it could be I mean, part of the explanation and, and, of what's what we're yes, seeing and it, if you could describe that agency in 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 variant terms, in simplistic terms, in in the way that we talked about before, then I think it's a plausible physical theory. And your intuition, and you've been developing this over your whole life, but uh, and it's it can become very compact. But to just tease part of it away, I've been um, listening a bit thanks to Brian Beshi. He told me about uh, um, Penrose's uh, video where he talks about a lot about retroactivity. So. He's very uh, much, and you mentioned the relationship between relativity and quantum mechanics and how, so I was wondering if you could speak a bit to that, because that's an important part, I think, of this mechanism, right? To me, you know, the, the, the operative concept here seems to be time, you know, that the way we look at time is kind of a spatial dimension for all its successes and all the amazing um, consequences of thinking of time that way, Newtonian kind of time as a, you know, independent um, or you know, well, is it is it is a parameter that 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 behaves like a spatial parameter? You know, it's a real number. We move through it at a certain rate and so forth. It's been an incredibly successful way of advancing physics. You know. And thinking about things so my deep intuition is that there's something wrong with that idea and that it's getting in the way and so this this uh way of thinking really messes with it it says that really the only thing that's real is history that um at least from a empirical point of view we have histories uh, this idea that we're traveling through some kind of medium in this organized way where all the dynamical, everything is dynamically choreographed as we move through is, a, is I guess, my position, it's a flawed idea and that that um, it's getting in the way. So, but what we do know is we have histories. We can all agree, you know, that if we can't describe consistent histories, then we don't have a physics. We don't have a physical, you know, I mean, that's an experience that we have of having consistent histories. We don't have any evidence that this moment, our history is the same as it was a second ago. We have no evidence of that. 
we think we do, you know, certainly our subjective experience is that way, but we don't, we don't know if something has changed our history. Like maybe I was never here before. We don't know that. Probably, probably it was. I, I'm guessing that if there is historical editing going on, it's happening at a very small time scale. In other words, all this stuff happens very quickly, you know, like, um, unless we set up an experiment like some of the spin experiments that have verified Bell's inequality, in which case perhaps we're reversing time by a nanosecond, you know, like, uh, well, if, if reversing is the right way of putting it. In other words, this editing is affecting histories that are as long as a nanosecond or two. It could be that since the beginning of the universe, we haven't backed up more than, we haven't edited any history that's longer than a few nanoseconds. I don't know. But my guess is that this might be a way of explaining the second law of thermodynamics where you're saying that if there's too much microscopic coordination that you get in like a bit of a loop, you know, in terms of, you know, things being inconsistent, inconsistent, inconsistent until you get back to a place where things aren't coordinating on a microscopic le level so much so you can move forward in, in your history. So, so it almost so, seems like, like it's... Graph, so like mowing as you go along any kind of a, any kind of a, a subatomic order that would, that might arise, you know, and then cause some Just, kind, of a, kind of weird loop, you know? So in this, in this picture of, Things starting off with uh, inconsistent, you know, contradiction, let's say, uh, but developing so that uh, what was one system all enmeshed in the beginning allowed itself to free up. You know, it's like there's two ways to deal with structure. One is you build it up, you know, but the other one is you cut it loose, right? Like you, you, yeah. you cut it loose. And so there's this cutting loose process that's happening possibly by that sloshing back and forth between those two worlds that say, but you have this cutting loose process. And what the, what is happening with those subsystems where you run into potential problems is that uh, there's all these and potentially maybe microscopic connections that are being done. And if they become too problematic, some of them maybe will get called away just to kind of keep these things from being uh, too connected, let's say, right? But, uh, you know, like, like you have a photon from one star to another star, you don't want it to be messing too much with, you know. So somehow yeah. like I don't know. You know, that that would be an awfully huge reversal if if there was some kind of inconsistency on that level. And if you think about what it would take experimentally to make a consistency that would say be a light year, you would have to have an apparatus like the the apparatus the you know that I think that we do these spin experiments over, a, you know, uh, maybe several hundred meter uh, span. But if you could do it over several light years, you could maybe <laughs> cause a reverse well, or, or an somehow editing. Somehow like to, to like, eliminate the problems of entanglement. I don't know. But um, yeah, no, I, well, you know, I guess maybe I don't, I'm, I'm not really quite understanding you. But somehow like there's this clipping effect, you know, you talk uh, about calling but to keep things from getting too connected. Yeah, I mean, when is the last time the universe had entangled pairs that were separated by, uh, separated by that many meters, that, um, where the whole the whole thing was coherent over that that span of space? In other words, it couldn't be that like a billion years that uh... it could be, but I'm just saying maybe that doesn't happen. Maybe it used to happen. Uh, back when there was some kind of before. well, but it used to happen means it's still going on. Like things are popping out from the Big Bang, or or you know maybe. after the Big Bang. Maybe and that would mean that you know we we'd look at the possibility that maybe our entire history, the way we know it, no longer exists and never did exist. Um, so it's a disturbing thought, but I'm thinking that. If this happens, it happens on a much smaller spatial scale, a much smaller time scale. Maybe enough to explain the second law of thermodynamics where half of the states are cold away, you know, this factor I mean, two. I, I, and then, how would you think of, I mean, it's hard to talk about human experience, but 
so do you think like we're on a single history or like we're uh we experience uh, multiple in parallel or is there some weird algebra of them i mean like, I, mean, I would like it work? to be a, i would like it to be a single history i'd like it to be that we you know when we talk we're actually agreeing on on, on on a single history okay so like you and i are now participating in a single history and we're we're yeah. there's a single so that that goes to the whole at least our planet right like you know in the whole uh yeah right? i mean like that's, our, that's I mean, that's what the I whole want. whole planet shares a I, history. I don't want that... a many worlds. I don't want a two world uh, model. I don't want a many world model. You know, I mean, I think that it behooves us to look at the simplest possible context for, for physical reality. And if you have to beef it up to everything can happen all at once, you know, to me, it's not, it's not aesthetically satisfying. Maybe so, okay. it's the only way, maybe it is the only way of re resolving things mathematically. Um, but I'd so, like, to, so I'd, you're... I'd like to, I'd like to demonstrate that there's another, you know, so. Um, so your aesthetics seems to be that like, you like the part of physics that's minimal, you know, that there should be basically one, you know, universe, but you like the part that says it should be, you know, not just uh, arbitrarily created by God, but by some kind of, it'd be very beautiful if it was un by some kind of principles of selection, you know, like evolutionary principles. But that uh, presumably um, those are very powerful, very central principles happening on a very immediate scale um, in that they're like the medium for how physics is manifesting, like on the, on the, super super fast super tiny level like where there's this rapid culling which could be going through trillions i mean it, it could have been going since and i mean it just opens up a different evolutionary procedure where it's happening to the side of the universe so to speak you know like but it's basically creating that's part of this standing, unfolding like developing wave, of our universe like maybe like a standing wave kind of thing where you know the if you get consistency that begets consistency in other words well, but it's consistency let's say from the big bang right like so like yeah. that there's this there's this whole process that's acting on the universe since from the beginning and then it's in motion and it's just kind of like culling uh clipping you know weeding uh you know making room for it to kind of keep unfolding so to speak but that mathematically, it's possible to come up with a mechanism that would be physically satisfactory, intuitive, and it would kind of explain um, and shed light on what are the deep principles of physics, like from the, the laws of thermodynamics to, you know, explaining the collapse of the wave function to, you know, the origins of relativity, let's say, or, or whatever. Like all that would come out of some kind of, in the spirit of Stephen Wolfram in a certain sense, uh, at least in terms of some kind of like, Maybe. atomic yeah but but discovered not by asking you know ai to do it for us but discovered by simply you know meditating contemplating the uh you know delving into the math you know and, and collecting all these concepts that you're um you're drawing in you yeah. know into and i can't and i can't say i can think of all the stuff in a consistent way agency time selection um dynamical modeling um symmetries um portability occam's razor you know it's like um and especially when i especially when i think about agency and time like i can't spend too much time thinking about that stuff because i don't think i understand them you know mm -hmm. that well and so i try to push i try to push at those kind of philosophical limits sometimes um, but I, I'm in this paper bag trying to find my way out, you know, and, you know, if I, so I, I look forward you know, to a discussion with our biologists, um, and maybe, you know, other friends at Math for Wisdom to where they would listen to this video and they would, um, then offer their ideas, you know, that they think are relevant that you should know about in biology, kind of like yeah. they tutor you, like with some of ideas. I think that that would be very fascinating, uh. I think it would be, yeah. You know, and then how you would respond to that. So we would have like a yeah, maybe a there's session. a more vivid way of understanding biological processes that would be more. Could you uh, in terms of this? I, I've looked at the I've looked at the concepts that, and the I just wanted to say, like, uh, I hope that people who have listened to this can see the passion uh, that you've 
poured into this, uh, you know, how you've experienced these conflicts, uh, you've lived them, but not by like one pet idea or another pet idea, but like certain aesthetic choices that you have kind of like pulled together and that they are very much, uh, first of all, playing off each other, like into some kind of, you know, decades of trying to make some kind of coherent intuition and using your uh, advanced uh, mathematical um, biceps to uh, formulate uh, frameworks where where this would make sense. So, uh, go, uh, and, and I think most recently, uh, you had shown a two by two model, which just kind of explains that the quantum world is a projection of the classical world. Uh, and then you expanded that more recently uh, to a four by four model where, as you were saying, it's not that the quantum world is entirely isolated, but that there could be, it's sufficiently isolated, but there could be little feedback loops. Yeah. And so that four by four model, it to me, and that distinction between like, well, there's this smaller world, the quantum world, and then there's this larger framework, right? Like it's the distinctions between what and how, and then the big picture, like why and whether, you know, like there's this, so these levels of knowledge, how they fit that, that, uh, I find that uh, intriguing uh, to explore, yeah. but one, um, I guess the the thing I'd like, if you could still just say about the clash between, um, and this is maybe not just you, this is the classic uh, clash between quantum mechanics and relativity. Uh, how is that fitting into the problems and solutions you're uh, offering? And this like going faster than the speed of light, and you know information and and uh, and uh, retroactivity. How well, would you describe I think, I think that? basically it's if a, you know, the, from an experimental point of view, um, you can have coordinated events that seem to be coordinated uh, that are spatially separated and that they're simultaneous in, in, the, in the reference frame of the, the laboratory. And that violates... It violates relativity you know it, as far as we so can just these simple experiments where like you take spin you know yeah. up and down you generate them they head off you look at one you know the other and so that's that's problematic yeah. because it violates um the speed of light as a speed limit to the to the to the, to the universe so, or, you know to any kind of communication any, any kind of coordination the coordination process has to happen at the speed of light. So, so that's inherent in the collapse of the wave function. It also has that um, Bohm's Bohmian mechanics. Oh, because the collapse uh, happens instantaneously. Everywhere, everywhere all Bohmian mechanics. When one thing stops moving, the other thing stops moving instantaneously. This is why, even though Einstein had had encouraged Bohm to come up with a hidden variables mm -hmm. theory, he rejected it immediately when he saw that it was non-local. Mm -hmm. uh, so Einstein rejected Bohm's theory, and, and in fact, yeah, Bohm so what's your feeling about non-locality? So, like, so you, you, you know, in that? my in my way of thinking about the wave functions, like this kind of uniformly spread out, kind of rigidly determined in space. Once you know the momentum, uh, and it's uniform and modulus throughout space, that's also a state that cannot exist rel in, in relativistic invariance. So you just can't have a state like that. That that is relativistically invariant. It, 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 uh, you can't have phenomena that are, or if you do, it's got to satisfy a wave equation where the different parts become uncoordinated over time. And you can't have then a consistent measure. You can't have consistent measurement. You can't have like, uh, the wave function affecting one thing over here and another thing over there in a consistent way if they're if, if it's so spread apart so it's got to be and so, and so aesthetically how would you resolve that so the only way I, I can think of resolving it aesthetically is through some sort of a calling or you know in other words there are inconsistencies we're just we're protected from them by they never enter into our histories they're selected away in other words this niche that we're in, we're making observations within a certain quote unquote niche, um, never record anything other than states that are consistent with our, our theory. And so that 
that editing is taking place on the level, uh, just beneath the level of observation. Like in the world of possibility, it's not a problem, so to speak. It's just when you get just before the observation that it's saying censorship, you know, editing. Well, or you, you, you know, the observations seem to occur at half the rate they normally would. So something. Well, that's a consequence of yeah. the editing, right? So, so, um, but 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 the editing is somehow set up so that it's not necessarily culling all the problematic things. It's only culling those that are about to become observ observable. Because everything kind of violates the right. I mean, everything violates the. You know, it's it's not whether you go far or short. You know, everything that's traveling at the speed of light is violating the. Right. Right. Anything that's spread out and and can affect uh space like separation immediately violates relativity anything spread mm -hmm. out over space i mean you know, if your editing know. was very strict there would be nothing i think that's the problem that i see so it must not be completely strict in the sense of like you know it's only going after like that's maybe why your agency hierarchy is kind of relevant in a certain sense like there's only it's happening layer by layer or um is it or am I? Or no, again, I don't. I don't. I don't have a. I don't have a um, okay. coherent way of breaking down an agency hierarchy. You know. Well, um, maybe not the hierarchy, but but in terms of this um, this idea that the editing is happening uh, not directly and not universally, but only in special, maybe you know, in in certain in a class, let's say, of circumstances where, you know, you have to worry about, so to speak, let's say, because you don't, you would leave, you would it's leave forbidding behind, that. So. You would leave behind an inconsistent history. So, it, I mean, it, again, it, it it's sort of like there's this trickster, this global trickster that is keeping us from seeing the entire world. Um, well, or to flip but, but that very, around, I think the way I was describing it was to say, if you start with a state of contradiction where that's considered completely normal and acceptable, and you know how else could it be otherwise? But then you have these layers of structure which build up the idea that well, but could there be a non-contradictory world? Could there be a world of? And we kind of live in a world that is ambiguous in a certain sense. Like we don't see, we see that there's something close to inconsistency, but we tend basically not to actually get face to face with it. Directly, maybe, you know, quantum physics is kind of like getting us pretty close, you know, to seeing that. Yeah. But um, but the idea is that I'm basically flipping around. It's not like someone's tricking us. It's like someone is trying to create a world that's consistent, you know, so maybe they're tr trying to say, well, what are the tricks you need to do to have a consistent world? So maybe I'm saying what you're saying. Yeah, that's kind of it. Yeah, that's kind of it. It's like, you know, what is what are the what are the tricks? And as long as those tricks are not onerous, as long as they're, you know, as long as they're. Uh -huh fairly simple and universal and impersonal and easy and, and mathematically describable in a in a compact way, then I think that's plausible. That's what I consider plausible. And so and, uh, I think that like for example, the, just to say about the wondrous the wondrous wisdom that like you have the knowledge, you have the decision making, and then you have morality. Like you have something looking at that critical point, like some kind of vantage point that maybe makes it explicit, so to speak, you know, that says like um, one way to think about the morality would be like when you have the Helmholtz decomposition, let's say, where we are talking about uh, grad uh, uh, div curl, I think it was, right? Yeah. Like, And then, so you have grad div curl and you get this, I think it's the same as this division of everything to five, but you can extend that short exact sequence by saying, you know what, I want to add whatever... Uh, whatever field I choose as my initial condition, so to speak. I think you can do that, right? Like you can say, this will be my initial field. I forget exactly, you know, and see, that's a free choice you can make. And that's kind of like the choice of your, the moral choice, the conscious life. Like, it's kind of like saying like, what kind of world do I believe I live in? You see, you get to make that choice. And then you have to be, it's it's getting pretty close to like, that's the thing you're going to have to commit to in terms of consistency though, yeah, right? I mean, like, and so you get this division into six, like morality. And then like one step beyond that is in the whole, like, okay, well, are you able to be consistent? You know, how does that work? Then you need two minutes. minds, the mind that knows, the mind that does not know. 
Yeah, I mean, this isn't very exotic because even in electromagnetic theory, you can you can add a gate, you know, you, you do a gauge transformation right. on, on the vector potential, you can add any gradient to it, and you get the same predictions, but it can, you know, it can really simplify the analysis by by choosing the right gauge. And, and maybe that's the that's the quote unquote theory of physics, or that's the subject of the culling, or that's maybe the um uh the context for the history, like you know, like the definition of the history, like what is the history? You can't have a history until you have a ground for that history, you know, like to say this is the theory in which the history will be. And so, like all these in these agents or whoever they are, like, you know, partial or, or total or whatever, but they're kind of like um, pursuing these moral choices that may get culled, in so to speak. Like, you know, if your theory is bad, <laughs> if your field choice is bad, you know, you may run into, you get me go instinct or you may be fruitful. I don't know. Yeah. So to me, maybe the translation between our, vocabularies is i would say uh, intuitively gratifying and you would say maybe moral i i don't know do, do those do you think that those are equivalent like what i would say is like it makes well maybe and, and maybe with the idea that uh if physics itself um i mean it becomes kind of theological i mean or maybe eschatological or whatever the word is like the Theory of physics itself is saying, look, uh, well, th that I'm allowing, let's say the process of physics is saying, I'm allowing for all these theories. You can pick whatever gauges you want, you know, you can pick whatever fields you want, but see what's going to happen. Like which ones will be worthy and which ones won't, let's say, right? And so somehow, like maybe they're all, they are, many can be worthy, right? And many can be fruitful, let's say. But uh, and what do they have in common? I don't know, let's say. But And maybe many of them can coexist, let's say. You know, so maybe each of us is kind of like our own little theory, so to speak. Uh, you know, maybe that's the beauty of having a free will, is that you get to kind of get to choose hmm. something about your own uh, portion of the, you know, especially if you, you can be a subsystem, you get to choose your subsystem's theory, so to speak. And so how can they all fit together and how can they survive or not? Hmm. And I think then this uh, in wondrous wisdom, this essential thing like life, life is the fact that God is good, but eternal life is understanding God does not have to be good. Life does not have to be fair. But this idea that eternal life, like growing forever, learning forever, living forever, that's the whole point where we're living in a universe that's growing, let's say unfolding. That's kind of like, in, but it's not only growing in a dynamic way, but it's growing on all these levels of agency uh, is growing on these levels of, um, well, history, you know, but like a sustainable history, but like, can your history thrive, let's say, forever, so to speak? And it's setting up a framework for, you know, kind of like a universe for that to uh, be meaningful. So, uh, but that's kind of like what you're describing is that that's built into the physical nature, like that's happening across all systems, subsystems, you know, all participants that we have this and they all are kind of like bubbling out of this physical uh, medium, you know, that, that they're able to uh, be seeds in that medium, the spiritual seeds in that medium that are able to kind of like co-mingle, co-tangle, but have independence. So the physical environment is creating this uh, culling that keeps us sufficiently independent, that kind of respects our agency, you know, with regard to each other, whether you're a rock, you know, whether you're a, but how can you have things? How can you have beings? How can you have life? I think, like, I mean, that's aesthetically where you you seem to be I somehow. Mean, maybe that's a little bit too <laughs> spiritual, but well, it's also a big. You know, it's a bigger picture than I can really grasp. Um, like I said, I struggle with struggle with all these things um, at a philosophical level, like time. Uh, agency you know I, I think they're useful for kind of roughing up the ground a bit to get you thinking uh you know maybe in a in, in a different way sometimes you know it's, you, you, it's sort of like challenging challenging preconceptions but ultimately you know my wheelhouse is math like if like that's where I spend my I spend most of my time doodling because 
that's kind of what I know how to do. That's how I know how to incrementally advance my thinking. These other big things are, I just feel like I'm, I'm reaching for them, but they're, they're beyond me. They're, they're certainly beyond, you know, I mean, I'm grasping, like I say, I'm in a bag kind of trying to punch my way out. And, and I, if I, if I, if I dwell on these things too long, I find it becomes unproductive pretty quickly. Now, this idea that agency machine, you know, I, I pushed that out of myself over a couple day period and it was very uncomfortable. Like I knew there was something I was trying to, you know, so, mm -hmm. but that's about as far as I can get on, on general kind of thinking. Like if, if I'm not like, if I'm not working with a mathematical model, I feel like my thoughts can be come unproductive very quickly like i i can go off in some kind of rabbit hole like i don't have a good foundation for thinking in a general sense about things i have little notions that come up now and now and again but i can't indulge them too much because i don't feel that i don't feel i feel like by indul indulging them tangentially like letting them bother me as i go along it's a guiding light you know and perhaps i'm making progress over time but these aren't the grist of my day-to-day -day thinking. My my day-to-day -day thinking is really grounded in mathematical models. And so, and so, um, just to enjoy praise, uh, your vivid intuition, like your just ability to deep go deep, like you're basically inverting all the things I was talking about to say, let's not worry about you know like human beings. Let's not worry about God. Right. Let's not worry <laughs> about like that. Let's just go deep into these questions. Like, what can you garner from the most intense contradictions in physics? Like, and you have this list of concepts uh, that we've talked about, like evolution, learnability, agency hierarchy, culling, superluminality, editing histories, backwards and forwards, unitary relativity, local and non-local. Like, and they're all kind of like. Um, you have intuitions on those separately. You have mathematical understanding of all that. But you just dwell on these things where this whole world is like a nuclear reactor, you know, of ideas. And it's just kind of like, a, but these are the ideas that you have culled, so to speak, that are somehow in the depths. And so if you then take your mathematical doodling and then, or your mathematical like challenges and you kind of sort this out, whatever, you keep prying away, like how do they fit together? You see... So that is a very um, focused um, thing for all of us. And so to take it maybe to the next level outward, like you said, biology, to have you talk to our biologists, to have like a little bit more interaction, like, okay, you have instincts on evolution, but, you know, they have a lot of practical knowledge also about biochemistry, about, uh, you know, collective intelligence, about uh, all these things. So, but, but certainly the active inference model, the maximum entry principle, the free energy principle, that'd be fascinating to get to see what yeah. they would uh, bring to you. Yeah. You know, yeah. And then how you would respond. So, yeah. no, and no, also to mention, Aslam uh, Kakar is a sociologist. He's defending his PhD this month. I, I hope he may have already defended it. So, uh, we'll try to certainly invite him to that. Uh, yeah. So um, I'll say a prayer for you. Yeah. I kind of did say a prayer, basically saying that <laughs> I just want to uh, praise and thank God for uh, creating you, for somehow loving you so deeply. And like, you know, you're a real child of God uh, that uh, he lets you be, you let him be. But like, he's just uh, very much resonating in everything you do. And you have a lovely family, uh, your, your lovely children and lovely wife, Julie, and and you're so kind to other people, you know, but this all, this is such a treat in your life that you get to work on this uh, oh, yeah. when you do. You seem to relish it so much. So just to thank God and to ask that you be able to do that. And also to say, please uh, make for a very, um, well, wonderful journey to Lithuania. I'll get to see you in May. Mm -hmm. And this is a preparation for that. So, yeah. and I think also an inclusion just to thank like everyone watching to say, um, we've come to the point where we can start to connect, uh, I hope. So I ask for God to help with maybe, that maybe some, some other people will jump in with us. Yeah. yeah. And okay. other people we do not know too, please. Okay. Thank you for watching this video. 
please uh, go to mathforwisdom.com or simply read the description to this video to learn how you can join our Math for Wisdom discussion group and our study groups. Thank you for liking this video, for subscribing to this YouTube channel, and for supporting Math for Wisdom through Patreon. I'm a Patreon supporter for Math for Wisdom because Andres and I have been friends for a long time, most of our lives. And the conversations I've had with him over the years have been very useful for me. Uh, he's also a big, big fan, my supporter, you know, of my work. And um, we just we have deep conversations about math and physics that have been useful for charting the course of my interests. And you know, I'm just I'm grateful, and you know, I I want to support that, and you know, our weekly or bi you know semi-weekly or bi-weekly conversations have been have been um, very important for me in the last couple of years, especially. So, yeah, that's why I'm a supporter.